Back in March, we started the process of preparing this old Victorian cottage for a water-based underfloor heating system. In the first vid, there's a link on screen now, I taught you through the excavation, which involved seven skips, which is about 40 tons of soil, bricks and roots, a load of type one MOT, followed by a blinding layer, damp-proof membrane, and a reinforced concrete slab. But then we got architects involved to help us get planning to fill in this corner to create a better living space. Whilst we were waiting for planning, we got on with a garden, so it's taken eight months to get to the next stage in the underfloor heating project. But we're finally here. In today's video, I'll be outlining the steps that I've taken over the last month to get the underfloor heating system installed. From the prep work to the laying of the installation and some of the funky products I've used that aren't widely known about in the industry, but which made the job so much easier. I'll also be explaining why I ditched that polypipe system that I talked about in my March video, why we've laid the pipes in this circular design, what screed I chose and why. There's so much to think about when retrofitting underfloor heating and the first was moving the water main as we're moving the kitchen to the other side of the room and this is what was hidden under the old kitchen units. I might do a video on this if you think it'd be useful, but it was a relatively simple job once I'd broken through an old soil stack in the room where I wanted the new main to come into. It was basically a case of disconnecting it from where it did enter into the kitchen here and then rerouting it into the room next door. Now, in case you didn't know, the manifold is the central hub of the system that distributes the hot or cold water to each underfloor heating zone from your main central heating flow pipe. I decided to put my manifold on the wall in the TV room, this being a nice central location. More on whether that was the right thing to do in a minute. This meant somehow getting all those pipes from the kitchen through the wall and into the manifold. It was simpler, I thought, to get a strengthened steel box made to take the place of one course of the bricks than having to excavate two courses to put a concrete lint in. I thought about drilling a series of holes through the brick but wasn't sure how easy it would be to drill what are very hard engineering style bricks or for that matter to thread the pipes through, not having done this before. So with the new box ready to install I carefully excavated the bricks through the double course wall, inserted the box and mortared it into position using my new mortar gun that I'm slightly obsessed with. Obviously make sure you get structural engineers sign off before you start doing any alterations to your walls. Let's talk about insulation. Why do we need to insulate our floor? Well, the old floor in this room, as I said in my last video, was unpleasant to walk on. And what that was doing is it was creating a massive fridge um, in pretty much the whole house, a sort of reverse thermal element which was sucking the heat away. Now, if we want to put an efficient underfloor heating system in, it's really important that we insulate below that heating slab. That does a couple of things. Firstly, it makes it much easier to heat up the 50 mil of uh, screed that I've got sort of encapsulating my pipes, which we'll come on to in a minute. Secondly, it means that you can heat up that slab with the pipes in it at a much more efficient temperature. If you think that your central heating system is pumping about 60, 65 degrees around your radiators, the set temperature for my underfloor heating system is I think around 35 degrees. So you can see how much the demand is reduced on your boiler, but also what effect that's gonna have on your bills. And the next point is by having a very well insulated slab, that you're possibly continuously running a sort of set 35 degrees through, you've got this wonderful thermal element in your house that's effectively radiating heat up, where previously it was sucking all the heat away. And the last point to make here is there are building regs requirements, I think in part L, that you need to comply with. It does depend, as I said in my last video, on whether you are introducing a new element or renovating an existing element New elements have to comply with a lower U value of 0.18, whereas for existing elements undergoing renovation, there's a higher limiting value of 0.25. I decided in any event to try and um, comply with that higher standard. I went with 100 mil Celotex in the end insulation, which their online calculator said gave me a U value of 0.17. I got it from insulation for less on the recommendation of a mate and at £35 including VAT per sheet. You're not going to get it much cheaper elsewhere. And it arrived well packaged and in decent condition. So once I'd tidied up the damp proof membrane, I can always trim this down later but needed it out of the way for now, I could start laying the insulation. It's important to maintain a 25mm insulation around the perimeter of your slab, particularly for me with my uninsulated non-cavity walls. And so I cut a series of strips from some 25mm ecotherm I got from a local builder's merchant, using my circular saw with a glued mod on the fence to make it a bit wider. These I laid around the edge and then trapped them in place with the 100mm Celotex. 
I use an Irwin Universal saw to cut the PIR and you can see here the dust flying around so it's essential to wear a mask. I was fortunate to be gifted this Sunstrom mask back in May. Thanks again Ashley for reaching out to me and organising this. My carpenter mate John laid his 100mm Rectisal insulation a week or so before me and when he taped it he found the foil tape ripped as his floor wasn't completely even. So on his advice I bought some 50mm Gorilla Tape and taped the sheets together with this first before putting the 75mm foil tape on top. For the most part my floor is pretty flat so I probably didn't need this but it's a useful tip I thought I'd mention. It is a bit of a labour of love particularly squeezing sheets into the final gaps and I tried to get the fit as tight as possible to minimise cold spots and on this point you inevitably get the odd gap between sheets and where these are obvious I fill them with expanding foam. You need to get yourself a non-stick foam gun as this is the sixth can of foam on this gun and I still haven't had to clean it. Sam on my Discord forum, which you can access through Patreon or Buy Me A Coffee membership, pointed out that I should double check floor heights in a few places before laying the heating pipes. As ever, he's got a good point. We decided to rip up the floor in this room at the last minute and include it in the system, and my builder laid the concrete too high in one corner, which came to light when the Screed company came to double check levels. So I had to take up the sheet of 100mm insulation and replace it with 75mm. Why is this important? Well, the sofa I used is self-compacting, but not entirely self-leveling. And also, you need a minimum of 25mm above the top of the 16mm pipes. And in this corner, we didn't have that, as you can see here from his markings. I finished the installation at midnight the night before the heating pipes were laid, and the final job was to install the 150 by 25 mm edge foam expansion strip around the perimeter, which gives the screed the ability to expand and contract. This can also be used to contain the screed as it has a plastic sleeve along the bottom that can be taped to the insulation. I didn't need to use this though as I'd be laying a separate membrane, more on that in a minute. To fix the expansion strip in place I used some galvanised nails left over from my last roofing project. Not everyone does this but it's a good idea to put a membrane down to protect that foil layer on the top of the PIR from the screed. If you don't do this the screed can corrode the foil and Jim at E Tuppling, I'll come on to him in a minute, recommended to me I check out this stuff, Laminon. So I got in touch with Laminon and they kindly sent me this roll. And I immediately thought, God, is that going to be enough to go around the room? But it certainly was, and this is how much I've got left. But that's one of the beauties of this product. It's a thin, high strength, reinforced woven polypropylene. And as you can see here, it doesn't let liquids through. Now, there are lots of things I can say about this product. For a start, it's very high strength, so the pipes won't move once they've been stapled in place. And because it's so thin and not particularly wide, it's a one-man job to lay. I start laying it in the morning, the pipes were going down, and it was, it was incredibly quick to do. It decouples the screed from the insulation, which helps to prevent cracking. And because it's so thin, you can lay it flat without any creases. And this is an important point, because unevenly laid membrane is one of the major sources of cracking of screed. And best of all, there's a very clear 100 millimeter grid pattern on it, which makes laying the pipes incredibly easy. On the website, they show it for the most part being trimmed in the corners, but I didn't like the plastic skirt on the edge foam strip. So I decided to take it above the finished layer of the screed and just made sure it was well pressed into the corners to minimize any voids beneath the screed that could weaken it in the corners. When I embarked on this job I knew literally nothing about underfloor heating. I explained in video number one back in March that I was probably going to use a polypipe system. My only thinking was that they were a decent brand and so I assumed the system would be too. But after posting the video I got a comment from Jim Stafford who pointed out that the system they had designed for me, spacings being at over 200 millimeters, a high flow temperature of 50 degrees and large areas not being covered by the system because that was where the units were going. Jim pointed out that pipe spacing should be close to more like 150mm centres and the delta T, which put simply is the difference between the temperature going in and the temperature going out, reduced to between 5 and 8 degrees to gain a higher heat output at a lower flow temperature for a more efficient and future-proof system should I ever decide to change it to a heat pump. He also suggested it was worth covering the entire floor with pipes, not leaving gaps for kitchen units etc, in case we ever decided to move the units. This was a very good point and in fact became pretty relevant as between the first design and what we have today, we've moved the kitchen to the opposite side of the room. And in fact it keeps changing because now we're putting the fridge here. I suspect this point will be a bit controversial, we'll see what happens in the comments, but the thing is, this is a big old investment and you want to be thinking as much as you can about future proofing your investment. Now that the heating is on in this room, it's very noticeable where you've got cold spots. For example, where there's no heating pipes in this small section here between the two rooms. So just imagine what it would be like 
if you had massive cold spots where you'd move things like islands and units if you decided to move your entire kitchen around in the future. And one thing a lot of people are going to say is, well, you don't want all that heat coming up between, underneath units. But Jim's point, and we'll see how effective this is, is that you can simply insulate under any units where you don't want heat going up through the floor. So I got in touch with Jim, who works for a specialist designer and distributor of underfloor heating systems, sent him the plans, and he worked up a new design for me based on a Danfoss system complete with revised 150 mil pipe spacings. Uh, there's so much information on here. You've got the instructions on how to set the auto balancing valves. You've got the system summary and you've got the manifold summary with that all important flow return and delta T. And finally, a wealth of data on setting up the valves, including the settings that each valve needs for the auto balancing, which is not always available to plumbers when they install these systems. You can tell from looking at the system, it's decent quality, but it does have a few quirks. I don't know why they had the flow and return inputs as 15 millimeters when you've got a 22 millimeter flow and return pipe coming up to the system. I also had a few problems with these isolated valves dripping at the point where they're connected to the manifold. They rely on a rubber washer O-ring type system rather than an olive based system, which I think gives you a much better seal. But since I actually commissioned and turned on the heating, those drips have disappeared. And finally, I'm a bit disappointed that they don't put a temperature gauge on the flow and return pipe so that you can measure that delta T we were talking about a minute ago. Whereas Polypipe's steel manifold system comes with two temperature gauges. But what they do do, which is quite a nice touch, is they offset the flow and return barrels on the manifold, which makes it much easier for you to get the pipes into the flow section of the manifold. And that I think is a nice touch, shows a lot of thought has gone into this design. Jim also kindly offered to come down on the day of install to help me to set up the system. So the first job was to install the manifold, which Jim started putting together. It was kind of him to do this, but it's actually a very straightforward assembly process for us DIYers. I demolished this chimney breast up here to make way for the system. I started off by just screwing the manifold to a couple of wooden battens on the brickwork. Then I realised it would be much tidier and easier to work on later and also to look at if it was on a cupboard, if it was on a board. So a few days after the install, I remounted the whole system on a bit of painted moisture resistant MDF that I had left from the cupboard build that you might have seen in my seven part video series. A link to that's on screen now. Now you're probably wondering why we went for this circular design when you see a lot of the zigzag designs on the internet. The zigzag design is obviously much easier to install, but it has its downsides, and I'll let Jim explain. This gives you a better heat output, a right. heat transfer, because you've right. got flow return, flow return. Whereas if you've got a pipe meandering backwards and forwards, yeah. it goes from warm to cool. Interesting. So, yeah. in effect here, that's your flow pipe, so it'll yeah. be about, in your case, I think we're 35 degrees. Yeah. And then the pipe that'll be next to it, yeah. when we're running back, It'll be right. 30. Yeah. So you've got 35, 30, 35, 30, Interesting. 30. Zigzag backwards and forwards, you'd maybe have 35, 34, 33, 32. Yeah. yeah. So your floor temperature gets cooler yeah. as you go along the floor. Yeah. Your room temperature doesn't change much because mm. air movement will spread that heat, but it's better for your floor coverings. Yeah. And also the circular design is actually very straightforward to install once you've got the hang of it. Particularly armed with those spectacular grid lines you get with the laminon membrane. The trick is to leave 300 millimeter centers as you head in ever decreasing circles into the middle of the circuit that you're laying. And once you get there, you simply turn around and head back, laying the pipe in the center of that 300 millimeter gap that you left. It's really that simple. But there is a bit of a trick with those long rolls of pipe. I had one at just over 90 meters. You start from the center of the coil. And every now and again, you've got to twist it over. It's really a two-man job, this. Yeah. Yeah. Rotating it takes the twist out of the coil. Now let's talk about those clips. You've got a choice of systems from the most expensive option, mats that you press the pipes into, to clip rails, which you have to lay across the entire floor, which seems a bit mad to me, and won't necessarily work with our circular design. So individual clips that I used, where you have a tacker gun to fire the plastic clips into the floor. For what they are, these things aren't cheap at around 100 quid and they all seem to have a bit of a problem with jamming. You've got a stand at the bottom which works reasonably well. You've got a metal weight which you slide up to the top and then you simply feed the clips onto the machine like that and then that keeps them retained in position. Got that door that opens. It's quite a crude system but then it would be because it's only plastic clip. And what generally happens 
because these clips are all held together with paper you get a clip down at the bottom like that and you have to pull that clip out push them back a bit pull it out and that paper there see that's often the problem gets caught we started on the utility circuit threading the 16mm pipe into a piece of conduit which protects it as you pass it through the wall. I also had these 90 degree formers but there was so much play in that metal box I'd made we didn't actually need them. A set of cutters is handy but difficult to justify for a one-off install. I'd probably have used my miter saw if, I, if we didn't have this. And Jim also had a plastic deburring tool to clean out the pipe before inserting the Alupex compression fittings. Once in place, the pipe could be inserted into the flow valve in the manifold and tightened up with a spanner. The pipe was then routed along the wall to the utility, keeping a minimum 150mm from the wall to maintain screed strength. And once laid, then routed back along the same path to the manifold and into the return valve. Then the process was repeated until all the circuits, bar the final one that will be in the what will be the TV room, were in position. Why hadn't we done the TV room? Well, I ran out of time to get that ready before Jim arrived because I hadn't quite plumbed in the flow and return pipes from the boiler, located in the cupboard underneath the stairs diagonally across the TV room to the manifold. And this is the point which I have a regret. When I started designing the system, I thought the best place for the manifold would be in that cupboard, but quickly changed the location to where it is now, firstly because I didn't think there was enough space for all the pipe work in the cupboard, but secondly because at that point I wasn't going to do underfloor heating in the TV room. So a flow and return pipe would take a lot less excavation than taking 10 pipes around the edge of the room. But then I decided to include the TV room in the system because it was only going to add a couple of hundred quid to the price of the system and it seemed crazy not to excavate a load of damp tiles literally sitting on dirt whilst I had the builders there. And I didn't think to move the manifold back into the cupboard. But now I see the system in place, I reckon I could have just about squeezed the pipes for the manifold on this wall, which would have led to a much shorter flow and return run and make adding our lounge into the system much easier if we decide to do that in the future. I'm also going to have to hide the manifold in an accessible cupboard, although this isn't a problem in my case because I'll be building something along these lines. Why am I telling you this? Because these are the things you need to think about when planning your system. Anyway, I didn't think about it, so I excavated a channel in the PIR and encased two 22mm flow and return pipes, initially just below the surface, but was concerned that a 60 degree flow pipe might interfere with the underfloor heating pipe temperatures, and so sunk them to about 50mm deep in the PIR, and then put a piece of 25mm PIR on top. And if you're installing your manifolds like me where you've insulated the floor, put some protective floor coverings down as I had this mess to sort out after all the pipes were connected to the manifold. After bleeding a radiator to reduce the system pressure, I drained the flow and return pipes to the boiler so I could cut through them with a new 28mm pipe cutter I bought on Amazon. Good practice to deburr your pipes after cutting them and I connected the new flow and return pipes to the 28mm system flow and return pipes with 28 to 22mm compression reducing tees. Thanks to James at Plumber Parts for recommending jet lube jointing compound. This stuff is awesome. I had to make do with these pliers because, well, <laughs> my span is not big enough and full bore isolating valves which I was pleased I'd done when I had to shut the valves to lower those pipes in the floor after I'd refilled the system. I also fitted isolated valves at the manifold end. You can never have too many in my view because I wanted to fill the flow and return pipes to check my solder joints under the floor weren't leaking long before actually filling the underfloor heating system. The zone valve for the underfloor heating went onto the flow pipe and on Jim's advice I also added a bleed valve to the flow and return pipes so that I could purge as much air from them as possible to minimise air going into the underfloor heating pipes when I opened up manifold isolator valves. With that done I laid some more laminol membrane and the final heating circuit and big thanks to Martin at m4art.co.uk for dropping by to help me lay that final circuit and to help fill the system. Before you pour your screed, you have to pressurise the system. Why do you do that? Well, a lot of people say it's to make sure the pipes are fully expanded to prevent the screed cracking. But the guys involved on this project said to me the main reason is to check for leaks in the pipes. Jim had a pressure test pump, but of course we didn't get around to using it because I hadn't finished doing this floor. But as I've got a phenomenal water pressure here, it's at least eight or nine bar, I decided we'd be fine without the pressure test pump. You have to pressurise your system to about five or six bar to check for leaks. 
Now what I should have done is bought one of these to monitor exactly what pressure I was filling the system to. But anyway we didn't and here we are ready to fill the system with the mains water in here and the outlet hose to take air and surplus water out of each circuit. To fill the system you do each circuit one by one, fully opening the valves on each circuit until all air has left the system before then moving on to the next until the system was completely filled and pressurised. And here's the air leaving the system. At this point we could close the fill valves which actually have their own built-in key so Martin needn't have used the one on his key ring and then switch off the hose pipe. Everything was looking good with no visible signs of leaks so I could start thinking about the screeding that was going to happen in a week later. And at this point let's go back to that auto balancing. I'll let Jim explain. Right, one of the things about the Danfoss system is it has auto balancing valves. Jim there's two ways you can set up a system aren't there? So a traditional manifold you literally set up a flow rate so you'd require say 1.5 litres a minute through one circuit it could be as high as three through another yeah and um, the issue with that is as more and more circuits come on the flow rate changes yeah because there's going to be only a certain amount of flow can pass through those valves the beauty about the auto balancing manifolds with the Danfoss is that pre-setting valve yeah so what that does it's um, a little spindle within a within the valve that operates and turns and it'll maintain the correct flow rate regardless of how many circuits switch on and off. So what that means is you'll always get the correct flow rate through the correct circuit at the correct time. So with a traditional manifold as more and more circuits come on the flow rate reduces mm. and the heat output actually reduces in the floor yeah. because there's too much water well there's too much calling for heat in effect and you'd, that and, will stop and, that. and with the traditional ones you'd set that up here would you? You would so you'd always set the flow rate so but on this system this with the auto balancing that's fully open yeah so with this it's fully open it but, can be converted back to a normal one yeah in which and case just show, just, it, show everyone so what you do so to set the flow rate if you weren't using the pre-setting you yeah. literally turn that valve, yeah. watch the little plunger and there's little numbers and a dial. As soon as yeah. you get to the required flow rate, you'll yeah. stop turning it. But you'd have to do it across every single circuit. And then you've got this here which you move up and down. To yeah, that's just an indicator to, so you can to show see where you were setting right it to. Yeah. 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 With the Danfoss one, it's a case of literally turning the dial to a correct, to a set figure. So this and fundamental and the really important thing is you set all of those figures on your scheme um, we design, do. don't you? So our design actually gives you the flow rate and the correct figure. So it's a case of yeah. turning the dial to the required output, and then that will maintain that flow rate. And with the auto balancing valve set, it's on with the valve actuators, which are then connected into the Drayton underfloor heating wiring centre, so that each circuit can be individually controlled. More on that in the next video. And so what screed should you go for? Well traditional dry screeds even when expertly laid aren't going to completely encapsulate the heating pipes which will lead to inefficiencies in the way the slab heats up and convex the heat. So I decided to go with a liquid screed and as you can see here as the screed is poured it completely surrounds the heating pipes so there are no air gaps and therefore more efficiency with conducting the heat. After a bit of hunting around on the internet I settled on a product called Semfloor Therm for its conductivity performance and found a local supplier Riflo. Lewis from Riflo visited the cottage and double checked measurements to make sure the correct amount of screed arrived in the mixer on the day and also to check pipe heights as I mentioned earlier. We were going for a screed depth of 50 millimetres. Remember you need a minimum of 25 millimetres above the top of the heating pipe which in my case was 16 millimetres in diameter. The volume ordered was extremely accurate and we only had about half a cubic metre left that ended up in the skip. This site visit to measure was also very important because on the day a series of tripods are rested on the ground above the measurements with a central disc set to the exact finished floor level. So when the screed is pumped in they know what level to fill to. Remember although some floor firm is described as self-leveling I understand none of the screeds are entirely self-leveling. They all need placing and dappling. Riflo also checked the water content in the screed, instructing the mixed lorry operator to add extra after doing this test and set up all the pumping equipment to get the screed from the mixer into the house. A crack inducer, basically a piece of plastic quadrant, was placed in this doorway so that any cracks caused by movement of the screed, which doorways are vulnerable to, follows the line of the plastic strip rather than heading in the direction of the pipes. Once laid the screed is dappled to purge as many air bubbles as possible.
and then the kitchen sealed off with all windows closed for a minimum of 24 hours for the initial hardening to complete. You can imagine how I felt pumping so much moisture into my property given the videos I've done on damp and condensation. 24 hours in and the slab was set enough for me to walk on and some sort of insect had kindly left this track across the floor. 48 hours in and I could open the windows to assist with the drying process. After seven days, I could commission the system, also known as turning the heating on. At this point, you start with a flow temperature of five degrees greater than the temperature in the room where the screed was poured, and increase that by five degrees per day up to a maximum of 40. I never actually got above 40, 35. And you have to make sure the air temperature in the room while you do this never exceeds 25 degrees. You continue running the underfloor heating until you've got a moisture content of 2.5% cm. Now I haven't got a reader to measure this but it's pretty obvious when the floor is completely dried out because there were no damp patches left under anything I placed on the floor. Condensation had gone from the windows and my dehumidifier had fallen silent. At this point you have to reduce the heating into the floor by 10 degrees per day until it gets down to 20 and then switch it off for a minimum of 48 hours. And the obvious question you'll be wanting to know is how does it feel now the system is up and running? Well we clearly haven't insulated the walls yet, that's one of my next jobs when I'll be installing a breathable wall insulation system, there'll be a video on that coming out soon. And whilst it's not exactly glacial today, it's 8 degrees outside, the whole place is beautifully warm basically. And walking around with shoes off is, as you can imagine, a pretty nice experience. Not that that is obviously the, the most crucial thing about installing one of these systems. Right now each rooms are a comfortable 19 degrees with the flow temperature on the mixer valve on the uh, underfloor system set to just under 35 degrees. Now this will require a bit of adjustment and I'll be researching how you can achieve a sweet spot in terms of setting a flow temperature that achieves the desired room temperature with minimal cycling of the boiler. And any thoughts that you've got on this, uh, it'd be great if you could set them out in the comments section below. My boiler unfortunately doesn't support open therm, which doesn't help in terms of achieving maximum efficiencies, but we'll see how we get on. The surface is admittedly quite pitted, in spite of that dappling, perhaps if he'd done it for longer, it would be less so. So we've got all those air bubbles that rose to the surface, but to be quite honest with you, that really doesn't bother me. I'm gonna be installing a decoupling membrane with large porcelain tiles on top, the most important thing to me is that there isn't any cracking in the screed and right now there isn't a single crack across the entire surface of the floor. Touch wood. In the next video where I talk to you more about how I've integrated this with my Drayton Wiser smart heating system, I'll hopefully be able to delve into the settings in a bit more detail to report back to you on what the actual delta T is on this system and what temperature I've actually settled on. But of course, I won't be able to finalize that until all the insulation is in and the room is pretty much finished. But my suspicion is that we will eventually be setting the temperature on the manifold to quite a lot less than the 35 degrees that Jim has designed. So that's pretty much it for today. As I said, I will be doing a separate video on how we've integrated all this with the Drayton Wiser smart heating system, which is a pretty interesting one uh, considering I've only got a two zone hub. Uh, but even with that, you can integrate it pretty seamlessly. There's a lot to talk about in that vid, so I can't squeeze it into today's vid, as quite frankly, I think I've kept you long enough. As usual, details of everything I've talked about today, suppliers I've used, etc., etc., will be in the description below the video, which of course you can access by clicking on the usual show more or more links. And last but not least, if you're new to my channel, it would mean so much to me to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here and don't forget to click the bell notification icon so you, can, so you get notified of all my future uploads. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.